right, it's Marty here. Um, I hope you enjoyed that little song. My good friend Jason Sidwell, uh, he, I'm speaking Japanese again, he spoke, he wrote um, this really nice piece for me to play over. And um, it's, uh, it's an unusual piece in the way that the, it's not like any song that you would hear because it's only like a two minutes long. So um, that being the case, I've got a, a nice little chord progression and a couple other progressions that happen and kind of builds up at the end like, like a regular pop song. I think the most important thing that you can learn from this piece of music or this exercise, so to speak, is the pacing of the whole thing, the overall vibe of the piece, what happens, how I start and how I build it up and how I end it. This is the breakdown section. So the breakdown section is usually the part of the song that everybody wants to learn on guitar, regardless of the fact that what comes before and after it is probably much more important. You got that? <laughs> So now we're, we're kind of going back and forth from B flat to E flat, but like these are some little phrases in in roads, you know. That's nice right there too. So like the chord is B flat, but I'm playing like an A flat here, which is always nice over a, a B chord, a B flat chord. So what you got is um. Then you do that bluesy thing that everybody in the world does, but one thing that's kind of important is to do the things that everybody else in the world does, but do them in unique places. It's like an old school blues lick, but kind of sticking it into where it sounds a little bit unorthodox. Does that make sense? <laughs> something I kind of find myself doing a lot, not really on purpose, but just happening. It kind of immediately takes me away from that, immediately takes me away from that blues thing and gets me back into something that's a more of a melodic motif that I might do. So that's nice there, even, even there before. Playing that A flat chord again. So even while the B flat chord is playing, I'm kind of thinking, how can I stick these A flats in there? Because it just makes it sound a little bit more fun and a little bit uh, less orthodox. So you'll hear those come up several times while I'm playing over the B flat. So it's. <laughs> I got from that uh, um, E flat to A, uh, E flat to C major. These are all very normal chords, by the way. Um, normal chords are what happens in the real world. <laughs> Those fancy expensive chords, they happen at the NAMM show. So you could do something like this here, just to learn from this type of... Just like the motions that you can get from like one little phrase that you learn from my little thingy here, you can say, oh, well, that's a nice little finger. I stopped there, but why not go? You can do anything you want with that. So let's see if I can remember what happened after that. Oh, so it's the same kind of chord progression. Still in C, F, so it's very pedestrian, but the reason it sounds kind of cool is because I'm really following the chords here. Also with the same phrase, give it some spice in there. Chord is F. It's kind of a bluesy motif, so you're going to end up on a F7, but I put an F major 7 in there for one little second in there. That's the Marty thing right there. That's just what I would do, um, just because I'm bored with normal motifs. So. Mm -hmm. 
major seven. It's not going to make you sound like me. It's going to make you sound like you because the way you decide, well, I, want, I know the chord is just a basic F, but I think I'm going to throw major seven, my uh, normal seven. The way you decide to put those little different inversions is what is going to get you your identity and not necessarily mine. And then the next chord, I believe, is A minor. What I did was I took normal A minor stuff, but I moved it all around the neck. And this high note is an A, which fits the next chord, which is D minor. So I'm not really playing in time, I'm just like kind of clustering all these notes until the last play, last phrase, which I wind up playing in time. This is another typical Marty thing where most guys would go, most guys would do that. It just sounds sweeter to my ears and less pedestrian and also allows you to do more things. You got When you're on your first finger, you can do anything you want anywhere, really. I like the sound of uh, my first finger vibrato in that particular spot. It gives a real finality to the solo, which is important because this is the end of the main solo. And then comes another typical Marty thing happening here. Um, we're here on D minor chord, right? So the next chord is going to take us into the chorus of the song. The chorus all the way up until now has always been in a G major. G major to a C minor 6 um, type of motif. But now since we have a little two minute ditty, we've got to do a key modulation at the end to make it sound really special at the end. So how do we get from D minor to A flat? All you got to do is take the fifth chord before the A flat, which in our case is E flat. All right. So you're just jamming along on, uh, on, on D minor and then you know you need to get to that A flat, so all you need to do is just do this completely random. And you can make that happen. So this works in any key. It doesn't matter what the, the distance is of the chords before it. If you take that target chord and start one fifth before, below that, and then hit the target chord, you can make a key mod from anywhere. So one step above that is to take that fifth below chord, which in our case is E flat, and make it an encore. Here's the E flat in the bass, and on top it's got, uh, what do you call that? That's a D flat. So that's how it is fast, but to break it down a little bit slower, it's something like this. Which not only gives you that encore, but gives you a five note, no, five number note grouping, which also allows you to like stick out a little bit more. No, that's a, I guess that's a Marty thing right there. So if you go from the note before the target note, you can make the notes sing a little better. If you're here, all you can do is make the note go sharper. You can't make it go flat and sharp and, and sit on the note as nicely. So that's how I tied in the end of the solo to the main motif of the song. Getting down to uh, any key change, you can always use anything chromatic. The chord is, it's D flat minor. So I'm very safe note. And I'm gonna do a little chromatic thing that's gonna get to the next chord. So I'm gonna go. So basically, it's just arpeggio wanking in here, going in and out of arpeggios. But what, what makes it kind of interesting is the fact that the numbers are not like exercise-like. And 
and then there was a, a diminished thing after that. It's not the most innovative thing in the world to follow a diminished uh, uh, accord with a diminished in three uh, mm -hmm. step and a half intervals. That's kind of like the most basic thing you can do with them. But in this case, what I did that's slightly unorthodox with those is um, I went down and then I went back up, which is kind of a little bit uh, unorthodox, maybe. So I went and then and then back up. I really hope that uh, you can take something from this and put it into your playing. The only way to really get good at telling a story with your solos is to work on short bits of it. And so this is like a two minute thing, but you can kind of see how I took it from the beginning to the end and gave it some meaning. Now, if you can do that in a short period of time, then um, you're really going to be um, ahead of the game and get some good value from this rather than just the licks. Um, the licks, um, all I, I played them slowly for you. You should be able to pick some of them up. More importantly is the concept, the overall concept, a start, a middle, building up something really cool at the end. So thank you very, very much. And uh, I hope you enjoy um, this magazine, this article, and uh, my new record, Tokyo Jukebox 3. Um, and thank you very much, Jason, for doing this cool backing track for me. And I hope everybody enjoys it and stay safe. Thank you very much.